any plant, if you're ever doing research on a plant and it says it's full of saponins or saponins, mm -hmm. think when you make soap, what do you, what's the process called? Saponification. That's what you're getting. Those are, are large soap, what are called soapy molecules. And those are, are what act as anti-inflammatories. Not only anti-inflammatory, they act as, as a cleansing, um, not an antibiotic, but like more like an antiseptic. That's why if you take the yucca root, and we actually, we ought to take some of the leaves down to the water and you can make a soapy type of, of soap with it. It's not, you know, big tons of lather, but it's a real cleansing. You can feel the difference and you can see the soap molecules coming out of it. And it's just a real cleansing healing. So if you got like a bad cut or you cut yourself with a machete, this is a good one to keep it from getting infected. Doesn't, doesn't necessarily heal it, doesn't necessarily, you know, do anything, but it keeps the germs from taking hold. It's sort of like, you know, getting the, the alcohol, gelled alcohol and putting it on. But that's why it works for arthritis. It does not work for rheumatoid arthritis. It's got to be for just general osteoarthritis. Very good for that. In fact, you know, y'all familiar with the Nature Sunshine Company? Mm -hmm. That was probably one of the first herbs they encapsulated, they, they got known for was just yucca root in a capsule and that was it. But you can use the leaves too, they're not as, they're not as soapy as the root, but they can be and then the, even the, the uh, fruit will do the same thing. But if you take the, um, must be over there, um, if you take, you know how you can find the See, this is one that's, that's native. This is what they call bear grass. A lot of people don't realize we got three varieties of yuccas that grow from Florida all the way up to New York, New Jersey, that are on the, their East Coast yuccas. It's just like these little dinky uh, prickly pears we've got here. They're native too. They're just not the big, beautiful ones like you see from out west. And so these are called bear grass because you know you could string your meat up with them, make make your rope. But what I, what I want you to notice is see all the little fibers there? If you take that, soak this in water, what you're going to end up with is that all that outer part will, will rot off. This green part. And what you end up with are all these little blonde inner fibers. And that's what you can make your bowstrings, fishing line with and it is super super strong we've we've made vegetable bowstrings with this before that lasted a long time but you can take this even green strip it down get a twist started in it let it go back on itself and just do a reverse wrap and make real quick have you ever heard of, heard of pump lines, like for hauling packages you know, put on your head? You can see what Guatemala's doing. It's like real good for making pump lines and tying up things with it. Because once it's wrapped around itself in a reverse wrap, let me do it real quick. You're not going to break it easily. Sean, you look strong. Do you eat breakfast? Yes. Good. All right. Come break this one. You break it, it'll break at a weak spot, but not where it's been corded up. It shouldn't. Even green, it should be okay. Now, out west, the Indians didn't use things like rawhide. No, down south, they didn't use things like raw, rawhide for um, bowstrings as much because of absorbing moisture and will stretch. Out west, they did. But even out west, this was one of the preferred cordages. Let's see if we can break it right into there. And I sure. do it real tight. You know. It took a lot of strength, even with that loose wrap, didn't it? Yeah. They get very strong. And once it dries, it's even stronger. But if you notice, you know, it's gonna, these are going to stalk about so tall, real, real small. And then it'll have those white flowers with a green, what is it, calyx, I think, on the back of it. If you take the petals, you can eat them. They're really good. Just don't eat the green because it's bitter. And then when it goes to fruit, when it's still green, you can open up and, you know, it really varies from plant to plant, but it has a pulp in it that's sweet. 
that you can eat. And then of course you can do the, you know, the stalk for hand drill and bow drill as well. Is anything with saponins good for arthritis? Pretty much, yeah. Anything with those large soapy molecules are, are anti-inflammatory. And that's the neat thing about it. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of plants are either anti-inflammatory because of the saponins, I call them saponins either way, tomato, tomato, or from having uh, phytoestrogens in them, like kudzu, wild yam, black cohosh, uh, or the ones that, you know, uh, have a, an estrogenic or progesterone type action are all going to be anti-inflammatory. Now, that doesn't mean like for arthritis, they'll work for rheumatoid arthritis other than for the inflammation. Whereas if you've got rheumatoid arthritis, what are you wanting to use? Poke root. Poke root. What else? Something that will help reset the immune system to modulate it. Anything? Echinacea. To an extent, echinacea. How about wild yam? No. So wild yam is an anti-inflammatory, but it also helps. It's very mild, but it helps with, with modulating the immune system. First one is poke root, though. Most definitely. But this is... Performance, huh? is it internal or external? Internal. Internal. Internal use, yeah. And how do you spell that? S-A-P-O-N-I-N. Saponin. That's why when you talk about people making soap, it's called a saponification process. Sawbriar. Sarsaparilla. Smilax. <laughs> and what's in it? Precursors to steroids. Precursors to steroids. So if you go to the doctor and you got something wrong with you and they don't know what to do for you, nurse, what do they do? <laughs> give you they give you a steroid, some sort of some some <laughs> sort some form of a steroid. Because what does a steroid do? It reduces swelling, but it also basically masks symptoms until your body heals itself. This ha but you know, if you take steroids too much, what's gonna happen? <laughs> Eat like a hog, blow up like a hog. Whereas with this, because they're the steroid precursors, you don't. It's actually good for the liver. You know, that's why guys use it for building muscle mass when they go work out, get the, the tincture of Smilax at GNC, because it, it has that anabolic steroid action without having the anabolic steroid side effects. It actually does build muscle mass in men. It helps them to increase, you know, like, I think it's like 8 to 15 percent increase in muscle mass for men. Only for men? Women, it builds breast tissue use them in herbal bust enlargers does not build muscle mass that I'm that I have ever seen any studies or anything done on at all now this is the second thing like if you've got somebody with IBS of any sort as you report for the griping or gripping stabbing twisting of the colicky pains you know, on the intestines because of the steroid precursors they're anti-inflammatory and it stops the inflammatory process going on. And it also inhibits the, the histamine reaction so that you don't, it's not as fast as wild yam, but it's pretty quick. You just boil it and make a tea. And it's actually a you know, fairly good tasting tea. You know, it's one of the ingredients in root beer. But this is the one, we'll look at it some more and talk a little bit more about when we see the leaves here in a minute. And as you can see, Skip's got this all throughout the property. Any idea? Winter huckleberry. That's what they call it. You know what they call it in uh, Cherokee? You want Cherokee lesson? Mm -hmm. In Cherokee, they call this winter huckleberry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, pass it and smell that. But you can always tell it when you cut it. Look how obvious the, the green is in that. It, that shade of green is sort of, I won't say it's solely in winter huckleberry, but it's, a, it's a, just sort of a look that you know. But even more so, smell it. You can you can tell the smell. It'll vaguely, if you stretch your imagination when it's green, huh? It does, doesn't it? Or cabbage. When it boils, when you boil it, it does smell like cabbage. And you can always always tell it. Uses. Uh, good for prostate. Prostate. One of the first answer I was looking for, but it was going to be one I was going to discuss. What else? Someone's going to come 
blood, blood pressure. sugar. Blood pressure and blood sugar. Talked to a guy yesterday, did a consultation with him, and he's got what is, what's called essential hypertension. Anybody have an idea of what that is? That is basically hypertension with no known cause. You just have it. He eats, no, doesn't drink, doesn't use caffeine, eats healthy, raises bees, uses bee products, and his blood pressure runs high all the time. You know, why? Luck of the draw, just the way it is, you know, nobody knows. And uh, he uses the winter huckleberry, I showed it to him before, and it more or less keeps it from, from getting real bad. Um, I, I suspect he's not using as much as he says he is. But his cousin who lives in Florida use, has, is using it, and it completely keeps her blood pressure from spiking. Loves it. You know, but it, it's working better for her. So I'm, I'm going to have to get back with him and see just exactly, you know, how he's using it. We, we discussed it some yesterday. But this is probably the first plan I'd recommend for high blood pressure and high blood sugar. You said that it kept hers from spiking. Does mm -hmm. it normalize blood pressure or does it reduce blood pressure? It normalizes. So would it also work on something with low blood pressure? Yes. Now, the, and it does the same thing with diabetes too, whether it's high or whether it's low. It's, a, it's like a thermos. Hot thing's hot, cold thing's cold. How do it know? It just, it does. Typically, you use it on people with high blood pressure and high blood sugar for one simple reason. That's mostly what people have issues with. They don't tend to be low blood sugar and low blood pressure. You know, though there are some people that are. And it tends to regulate both. Works really, really well. These are the ones where I always tell the story where Jane and I went to the Grand Canyon one year and took the train from Williams up to the canyon. Met a couple that from California and the guy said, listen, I don't eat right, I'm not gonna eat right. What can you do for me? So I got him on this, and for about three years, that's all he stayed on until I, he, I kept sending about every three months, I'd have to send them more. And finally, they, they found a, a variation of California that they could use and uh, loved it. Had a lady as a professor at Jacksonville State, I put on for high blood pressure. And a week later, I got an email late one night saying, well, when's this stuff supposed to work? And I was going to email her the next day, got up the next morning to email her and had another one set, never mind. I just took it and it's coming down. And it takes about a, a week to two weeks and it starts, for most people it starts to regulate it. Now you said prostate. This is herb number two after New Jersey tea to reduce it, to mechanically reduce the swollen prostate. It does not affect PSA levels, but it mechanically reduces the swelling so that you know, a guy can urinate without hurting or have to go to the bathroom so, so often. And one of the things that's really high in this are tannins. So you can, so in class we always talk about extrapolating things out and well if it's a tannin, what does a tannin do? It dries things up. So well this might be if you don't have any other things you like better, you might use this for a wet cough. Or to help a, a, a nursing mother dry up if she wants to dry up her breast milk. So there's, you know, all sorts of, of and it's not to say that it will do that. Most likely it will though. So if you can't find, like say you've got a nursing mother says, God, the kid's eight years old, I'm ready to get them off the breast, you know. <laughs> and I don't have any, and I don't have any, any garden sage, which, you know, really will dry you up fast. You say, well, why don't you try some of this? You know, this might work. Or white oak bark, or any other number of plants that are astringents and will, will dry fluid up. Or if somebody, in this case, has a, a wet, cough and they got lots of fluid in their lungs well you know if this dries up things this might be something worth trying it's like when i teach people bow drill hand drill every book on wilderness survival you see will say don't use conifers don't use pines because there's two resins they won't work well what if you live in ontario canada and all you've got are conifers do you get out in the middle of the woods and just sit down and die no you try a conifer and actually you can make them work they don't work great but they can be used and um, so you learn to say, well, if I don't have this, what's around that has a similar action because of the chemicals? And it? it's like the sumax, you know. Well, what's in sumac? Tannic acid and gallic acid, which are both extreme drying agents. So they're good for wet coughs. Whereas if you had a dry cough, we've talked about using, you can't use it, onions. Why? Well, if I don't have any onions in my garden, what do I do? Go out in your yard and pick the wild onions or the wild garlics because they'll do the same thing. Or if you don't have that, go out and pick the plant I didn't show you up here, sow thistle, which we'll see around in here. Because it's a mucus producing herb. You know, and that's one of the reasons it was used to produce uh, milk in pigs. 
and so if it'll produce milk it it's most plants are not going to be real okay i'm only going to produce milk they cause the production of fluids and that's what what they're doing what about turnips 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 don't do a freaking thing okay I don't need them. <laughs> no. I don't like them. <laughs> Sweet gum. Makes what? Homemade Tamiflu. Out of the seeds. Ed, did you have, have you made any yet this year? Yeah. Did you? Okay. What yeah. color did it end up being? Brown. A brownish red, right? Yeah. Very, very pretty color actually. But if you don't have, and we saw somewhere where we were not too long ago, a bunch of them still green. Remember? Yeah, it was up at the uh, no, it was up at uh, Jeff's place when we did this survival weekend. Yeah, right and I uh, surprised this late in the year. But if you don't have the green seeds, and I'll tell tell y'all that because y'all know. But all right, you know what Tamiflu is, right? For like swine flu, bird flu. Well, Tamiflu is actually made from a plant called star anise, which is a, a, a licorice smelling herb used in Middle Eastern cooking. You cut it in pieces, cross section, it looks like a star. That's where it got the name. And it'll, each one will have a red seed in it. The chemical in work is, is called shikimic acid. And they have found that shikimic acid is that, so actually Tamiflu, when you get prescription medicine, is an herbal medicine. That's all it is, just shikimic acid out, out of the star ends. But the first plant I ever learned just about was from Tom Vass was sweet gum bark for the flu. And he said, go get you some sweet gum bark and it'll kill the flu graveyard dead. And he didn't know about shikimic acid. And I didn't at that time. And, but that's what it is because this has shikimic acid in it. I think star anise is like 7% by volume shikimic acid. This is about 35 to 4%. But it's still more than enough to do the job. And every other tree in some areas is a sweet gum in the south. So there's no shortage of them. And the seed in the balls, you got two seeds in each section. One's a fertile seed, one's an infertile seed. The infertile seed is the most high in shikimic acid, then the fertile seed, then the green ball, then the leaves and the branches but all of it will work. So you can just take this, boil it up as a tea, or make a tincture out of the young leaves, especially, or the inner bark, and you've got your own shikimic acid. And it's as if it is as effective as getting commercial prescription for Tamiflu, easily. Star anise isn't local. No, star anise grows in, mainly in four provinces in China, where they grow it, and two of them were the ones hit by the earthquake a few years back. And uh, then Merck Company kept buying up all they could so it actually got in short, short supply for a while. And, uh, but the, whereas this is everywhere. And it works just as well. You know, you just take the, the leaves, the bark, boil it up as a tea and drink as hot as you can stand it. And what it does is it inhibits the ability of the virus to reproduce. So, you know, um, bone set will kill the virus. Whereas this just, it's what it does is in order to, all right, how many remember your high school science class? All right, what's the difference between a virus cell and a regular cell? What does it contain? RNA. RNA, not DNA. So in order to reproduce, a piece of that virus flakes off, finds another piece that's flaked off from another one, and that's how they combine their RNA and become the new viral cell. Shikimic acid in rabbit tobacco does this, will do a similar type thing. Inact, in my opinion, the way I, I understand it, inactivates the enzyme that's necessary for that flaking to occur. So if it can't flake off, it can't reproduce. And viruses have a finite life. They don't live forever. So as they're constantly dying off, they're not reproducing more of themselves. And so instead of taking two or three weeks, week, week and a half, and the flu's gone. So that's the advantage to it. Rabbit tobacco will inhibit the virus's ability to replicate as well. And that's one of my next to rabbit tobacco, I mean next to a sweet gum, rabbit tobacco is the next one I would absolutely first go to and elderberry along with that because it does the same thing with the ability of that virus to replicate itself. It's like if you give, uh, say somebody's overdosed on narcotics, you give them Narcan, like what, 0.4 micrograms I believe it was, and it occupies that keyhole slot that the narcotic would inhabit. So as long as you give them the Narcan periodically, they instantaneously or in withdrawal, they're out of it. But then when it wears off, they can get back in. And that's what the, the shikimic acid does, is it, it, it occupies that, inactivates the enzyme, and so the, the RNA can't flick off. Now, if you've got somebody that's got mild arthritis, 
this is just temporary relief. Get the younger leaves at the very terminal end of the branches. Put them in some hot water, make a poultice, and put that on that joint, hot as you can stand it. And for you know a few hours to a day, it'll loosen everything up, make it feel a lot better. And then I use it in all of the cough formulas. If, if you ever make a cough formula to bring phlegm up and out of the lungs, make sure you put sweet gum bark in it. Because what it does is it acts as a stimulating expectorant, and brings all that crap up. This is called pineapple weed because it smells like a pineapple looking smell. I mean pineapple looking smell, pineapple smell. When it's green? When it's green. I don't know if it, I don't think it would right now. It, it kind of does bit. actually. Does it still? Mm, a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also great tender because that's how he built fire this morning. Did he? Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's got a little bit. Not real strong, but yeah, it's boosting like dirt. But when it's real fresh, I mean, it smells just like a, a nice citrusy pineapple smell. Very, very green. But it, and believe it or not, you know, it has the yellow flowers on it. Yeah, but they're so tiny. Mm -hmm. But it's it works just like any of the hypericums, the St. John's wort, to, as a as a from mild to moderate depression. You asked the question about St. John's wort. It Sir? acts exactly the same. He asked me this morning, did it work the same? And I said, yeah, it does. In a milder form. Not as good, but close enough. Mm -hmm. But it only works for mild to moderate depression. Severe depression does not respond well to St. John's work at all. And if you're real fair skinned, it can cause photosensitivity. And if you're on birth control pills, it can interfere with the birth control pills. Which is why, as they say, you end up pregnant and depressed. So you got to watch it. <laughs> but uh, but it does work. The, and see the and the reason you don't normally use this much is because the main chemical is in the flower, and these are like tiny, tiny flowers. Whereas you find the shrubby St. John's wort, like you've got it all up in Huntsville, up on the mountain there, grows about so tall, has blooms this big. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a lot of picking to to do the same thing. But it's also good. You can put it up in a, a liniment form for for wounds and bruising, it's pretty good. And we've got St. Andrew's Cross, St. Peter's Wort, they're all high pericums and they all work. And we've actually got the European St. John's Wort that grows, it's naturalized in this country now. I've been waiting for a yeah, we're showing real purple. purple for the house. See how purple the cross line gets in there? Mm -hmm. All right, this is one of the sawbriars, one of the smilax. But as we go further down the line, you're going to see some that have a big broad leaf. Some have a narrow leaf, but not as narrow as this. We've got here, we've got sandbriar, catbriar, uh, bullbriar, carrion flower, which looks like nothing like any of these because it has a big broad leaf, no thorns. Jackson vine, you know, so we've got seven or eight species or varieties within that species of sawbriar, but they all work the same. Not a bit of difference between any of them. The only the only difference is leaf shape, fruit color sometimes, and some are more purple than black, some are you know blacker, and uh, some of them the, the big rhizomes are bigger, but they work exactly the same. There's no difference. In fact, if you go to any garden shop, you'll find Jackson vines for sale, and that's just a sawbriar that doesn't have a lot of thorns on it and puts beautiful flowers out. So people grow it because they can grow the big leaves and it makes a big shade cover. And that's mainly the root though? Is you what? It, it's just mainly the root that you use? It's only the root you use 99% of the time. The, the fruit can be used but it's only used for like a horse throat. You know you suck on one for a horse throat when you're talking or something. But for medicinal purposes use the roots. And it's quite what are called Okay, you know what the difference difference is between a root and a rhizome? If you look at this thing, you see it's got, it looks like these big knobby pregnant female termites, you know, and those big knobs, those are rhizomes. Then the roots are the little hairs coming off of it. That's the only difference between the two. But that's what you use on that. And that's where you'll get the, you know, the sass, uh, sarsaparilla tea, root beer comes, that's one of the ingredients in root beer. Uh, can you eat the edible, uh, the green tips right. of the whole family? Or? Yes, okay. every bit of them. Even down south in like say with Wetumpka, and then they got black and red bamboo, which is that big around. They call them wait a minute vines because the grapes that wait a minute. You can even eat the tendrils off them. It's just a bigger variety of, 
of Smilax. Okay. We dug one one year doing a, a wilderness survival week in North Florida. The guy was bulldozing a road through and he bulldozed one up that it would have been a tough job getting it into the back of my pickup. It was that big. It was a mass of roots. And it was all nice beige color, but where the blade split part of it, we came back a few hours later and they'd already started to oxidize and turn red. But it was that big a clump of roots. And that's what, but that's what you use. And to make the, what they call kunti in, in Florida, the Muscogee Indians would make, you, you precipitate the, the starches out of them. And once you get the starches out, you make a, it makes a jelly, it looks sort of like an aspic, and it turns red. Real pretty, called red kunti. This is probably, we're talking for respiratory viruses, you know, about five or six down the line that I would, I would go to for respiratory viruses. You know, it is a eupatorium, just like boneset, joe pie weed, queen of the meadow, all of those. And it was mainly traditionally used for um, typhoid fever. And what is it called? Called dog fennel dog summer dog. cedar. It's eupatorium capifolium because of the, the real fine leaves mm -hmm. on this. But you're going to use it when it's green? Use it when it's green, or, or right now you could use the roots. And very good for for respiratory viruses. And see that that's when you start using herbs for viruses. You've got to pay attention to what kind of virus am I trying to treat? Am I trying to treat mm -hmm. respiratory viruses? Um, a virus like viral meningitis, mm -hmm. whatever. Because some there are some plants that work like rabbit tobacco, even though it works really well on respiratory viruses. Yeah, there we go. Take a bite of that. Pinch some off and eat them. You'll like the taste. Um, and then, you know, some that work on, you know, all viruses in general, but a lot of them are specific to respiratory or specific to members of the herpes simplex family, like the chicken pox family. And so you've got to learn to hone in on which ones are going to work best for that type of virus. And then you work on, you know, of course, you say, well, if I'm going to do this, you know, which herb works best for the symptoms of that respiratory virus? And then which herb works best to kill the virus or inhibit the ability of the virus to reproduce itself, to replicate. And, all. and so that's where it gets, you know, you've got to start learning the differences in how they work. Because if you look at um, lemon balm and heal all, real specific for the herpes simplex family, I would not personally be putting those into a respiratory antiviral. Not say they wouldn't help. But why would I do that when I know for a fact mm -hmm. that summer cedar, bone set, etc., etc., specifically hone in on that respiratory type of virus, Joe Pye weed especially. So, you know, that's where you got to start differentiating. And it's like um, making cornbread, you know. Some people like yellow cornmeal, some people like white cornmeal. You know, whatever floats your boat taste wise, because it makes you more satisfied. And with these, you have to say, well, what's going to work the best for that type of virus? Because not all viruses are created equal. So is this whole group of uh, plants, the Joe Pye weed? The, uh, called are, eupatoriums. Are they, are they eupatoriums down on the, on the fourth or fifth on the list in that grouping? Or is there some of them that would be uh, first Joe Pye, if I was, Joe Pye weed? Okay, if I was to take respiratory viruses and I was mm -hmm. using the eupatorium family. Mm -hmm. All right, first two to consider mm -hmm. would be Joe Pye weed, the queen of the meadow, okay. and bone set. Okay. Those would be the first two, and depending on what I was wanting to do, would would change things. You know, was I wanting to work on in, inhibiting the, the ability of the virus to replicate, but also at the same time sweat? I'd use bone set. Okay. If I wanted to inhibit the ability of the virus to replicate, but I didn't want to make a sweat, so I would. You wanted to cough. But I wanted no. It doesn't. I'm not talking about coughing. This is this is getting rid of the virus. I'd use bone. I'd use the Joe Pye weed because it's, it's not a big sweater normally. You know, uh, was I just wanting to um, work on the virus without sweating? I might go to dog fennel. Yeah, so it all depends on what you're trying to do within even that family, because bone sets are gonna be bitter. Mm -hmm. So what does bone set stimulate? The liver. Mm -hmm. If, what does the liver do? What production 
the liver has a big part to play in the functioning of the immune system. Okay. So if I want to stimulate the immune system, I would go with the more bitter members of the Eupatorium family because that's what they do. They stimulate the immune system. If I wasn't trying to stimulate the immune system, Joe Pye weed, uh, Queen of the Meadow, the Summer Bone Set, or this because they're not bitter herbs. All depends on what you're trying to do. Let me ask you a question. I saw you had a person that had a problem with an overstimulated immune system like rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, mm hmm. What would you do to balance that? Um, Are we talking about for somebody's got a viral yeah. infection? Yeah. I would not use Bone Set because it is a bitter tonic. I would not use, even though they're not bone set, Eupatoriums, we tend to use them a lot together, hyssops, because they're, they're bitter tonics. I would use nothing that stimulated the liver. Now, I would also look at using poke root, mm -hmm. because poke root modulates the immune system. So even though we look upon it as a, as a liver herb, it is stimulating the liver only in the sense that it's causing it to function properly and fun causing the immune system to, to function properly. So, and it's a powerful antiviral just by itself for any type of virus. In fact, if I was to travel and take nothing else with me to keep from being sick, it would be poke root tincture. Because if it touches it, it kills it. But, and even though it stimulates the liver, it stimulates it to function properly. That's why you can use poke root, root especially, for rheumatoid arthritis as well as osteoarthritis because it acts as an anti-inflammatory for the symptoms but at the same time it causes it helps to reset the immune system you know like why do you have rheumatoid she doesn't have rheumatoid and he has rheumatoid and you don't have rheumatoid we should all have rheumatoid or not all have rheumatoid you know why essential essential uh, hypertension why has he got it and nobody knows but what it does is it tells the, the immune system to quit attacking itself. And so you can use it along with um, Summer Bone Set, one of those that, that are antiviral, or even, you know, go to the Lemon Balm and Heal All if you want to try that and uh, do the same thing without, you know, causing a stimulating effect on the liver. Does poker, uh relieve any of the symptoms of autoimmune disorders? autoimmune portion or it just okay it, or it just is making no it relieves because what it does is it resets the immune system to where people see, can see you know not everybody responds the same as everybody but what for the people it works for they end up with significant relief from it and when do you harvest poker year round okay. yeah year round it doesn't matter when you know you'll see in some books they don't harvest fresh don't harvest dry blah blah because it's too strong that's a bunch of baloney it, uh, okay. once, once, so it's, tinctured up the once it's tinctured, whether it's fresh, the only difference between using it fresh and dried is the strength of your tincture because you're going from a, like a two to one ratio, you know, to, or a five to one. And that, but that really does not mean anything. People make, th people make herbal medicine too complicated. And part of it has to do with making themselves seem real m mysterious or very Physician-y, as I say it, you know, you got you got two in this uh, uh, quick soap box. You got two groups of people in this field. Well, third, you got a third group of us just don't care. But you got the basic <laughs> herbalists who are tied to the land, and then you've got people like with American Herbalist Guild, so, you know, large portion of them that are becoming a a, a guild, uh, almost like a union, uh, where they want to be accepted at the next level to being being physicians and so everything with them has got to be double blind placebo controlled study with the plants it's got to be specific formulations with everything or you're looked upon as being an ignorant hibbly herbalist okay but what they've done is they all started out as herbalists because they were helped or somebody in their family was helped with herbs or alternative medicine and then they got too big for their britches so they want what they're what they're trying to do, and this is not the HD, but this is a lot of groups that are trying to get licensure for herbalists that are trying to push everybody else out because you're ignorant if you don't fall within their their club. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they but then again you take them out, they couldn't tell you summer cedar if it was flapping them in the face, you know. And they're herbal pharmacists, 
and they do and they're getting and some of them are a lot of them are becoming guilty of the same thing that modern doctors are of having a reductionist approach to everything bring it all down to one chemical you know like mm -hmm. hyperacin and make sure that's not somebody lost that's me um and they're getting away from the fact well you know for example um what works in yellow root is an antibody. One of the main chemicals is berberine. But if you just separate berberine out from the yellow root, you may or may not have something as effective as if you're using the whole plant because, the, you know, back in the 40s and 50s is when all the synthetics came in. So a lot of plants got dropped from the pharmacopoeia because they could not find the chemical in them that worked. Well, that was 50, 60 years ago. If they came back with modern machinery, did the same test, they might discover the chemical that's causing it to work but each generation says well our technology is the best you got and if it doesn't find it it can't exist so they're saying the same thing now if we can't find it it doesn't exist in 50 years from now they might find that same chemical that does it but we seem to think that you know everything can be isolated off it's like with um, sassafras you know they isolated saffron off gave laboratory rats bucket loads of the stuff and they had elevated liver enzymes so they took saffron off the market from sassafras products because they could cause cancer you know but it was you know you don't drink just saffron when you make sassafras tea anyway oh yeah i back i was going to the cross plane all right terry you got your first assignment uh -huh. write this word down r-a-u w-o-l-f-i-a Anybody ever heard of this plant? It's from India. It's called Rawolfia. You're gonna look that up and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. All I'll say is this, it's used as an antipsychotic commercially. It makes a chemical called reserpine. Very and it's actually a, a rather toxic chemical. Good, good is it? Or is this as good as it? That's this, the question. This is better, probably. Um, no, this is cross we'll show you in a minute. Right here. This is the one that back when Tommy Bass was, was a kid, they were plowing with horses and mules. And you had the horse or mule just plowed to death, the kidneys shut down, wouldn't eat, you know, just about on its last legs. They would take cross vine and they put it and they put pipsisawa, or rat's vein, which worked on the kidneys. In their feed, three days later, they're back plowing again. So he figured if it's good for a horse, it's good for a man. And started recommending it to people. And, you know, three or four days after drinking the tea, which tastes good, mm -hmm. you know, you got more energy, more stamina. And people will always tell you, they say, well, I feel better. Well, about two years ago, this guy that's going to Bastyr University, which is a big naturopathic university in Washington, uh, came down, we were looking, and he took, uh, and I sent him some, and they actually did gas chromatography on this and a couple of other studies and found reserpine in crossfire. What is that? Reserpine is an antidepressant, antipsychotic. That's it. It's in Rawolfia, which is a, a, a plant that grows in India, which is one of the first antipsychotic medicines commercially made. I mean, as a pharmaceutical. And, but the reserpine, it's the only other plant they've ever come across. Now it's too best here is in this plant but it's a very tiny little amount and so that's why after three or four days of drinking it'd be so, you got more stamina more energy but you feel better because of the reserpine in it now what is describe the back side uh it's smooth and tan smooth and tan leathery yeah all right that's a false turkey tail a true turkey tail is going to be thick Yeah, it feels like it. it's all flaked off, but yeah. Whereas the true trickle is going to be thicker and it's going to have yeah. tiny little micro microscopic okay. pores that, that you, you really got to put your eyes on it to see. But these are leathery. Now these are also medicinal. They are they have anti-cancer immune modulating properties, but not like turkey tail. And turkey tail mushrooms, if, if y'all see these, well here, pass them up. This is very common, This, but you'll see all these little bands in it, like a turkey tail, like feathers. 
but the back side of it is leathery and, and smooth, no pores. That's a false trick. You and they can vary in color from this to brown to... to no. Mm -hmm. That's called a brown jelly. Well, it won't necessarily the pan will be white when you see it's a real oil. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, now pass that around. All right, wait a minute. Oh, is this kind of like the lichen? No. Uh, the, the turkey tail family is a specific for breast and uterine cancer. Mm. It works in general on all cancers. Also for the, uh, the immune modulator. Now, the fungus she's holding around, if you want to be 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 adventurous, take your bite out of it. It's not rotted. That's just the way it looks. Take your bite out of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? am, I gonna, am I gonna regret this? Go for it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. When we get back we'll look it up and see what it is. Uh, <laughs> no. And that's what you're gonna notice. There's no real taste to it. But you eat um you eat another you've eaten this mushroom in another form a lot if you eat Chinese cooking. They're oh. called tree ears. Oh, they're worms. No, I won't bring That's protein. Yeah. Uh, and they're called tree ears, <laughs> or wood ears. And they put them in, they put them in Chinese cooking for, for texture, because it'll, it'll get a little bit of chewiness to it. And, but there's no flavor. It takes on the flavor of whatever you cook it in. And these oh. are actually, the members of this family are real good um, uh, medicinal plants. Anybody else want to? And you'll see, see what the, this feels like? you'll see the the tree ears on trees, and it looks like a little brown monkey ear. I mean, it's shaped like an like an ear even. And in fact, its botanical oh, name is word. like is is like Aural auriculus, you know. This is the time of year you'll find them. They're called aborted entolomas. Which basically, what it's saying is that the see how this one was eventually you could extrapolate that out into a cap coming up. They abort the process and just warp. Get a good picture of that too. Right? Right. And uh, it's a it's a real good edible mushroom. Thanks. It's like any mushroom. You can saute them, fry them, whatever. But what I would do is to double check what I say. Is when you get home, Google aborted into llama, so you don't feel like I'm poisoning you. But that's what they're called. And there's there, there's another mushroom that acts weird like that and we'll we find them here in pine thickets under the pine straw called a lobster Baby mushroom bags. and it's where another fungus uh, will attack uh, usually it's a russula and it takes over and morphs into looking like a big orangey claw looking sometimes mushroom and it tastes like lobster of course these do not taste like hostess cupcakes but they're good I think so yeah see what they're right here they're coming off the roots yeah and I think they're just washed out and old. They could yeah. be. It could be something else. They're all down to there. Yeah. All right. This is actually an orchid. Alabama has, I think, thirty something or more species of orchids, but they're all ground dwelling orchids. They don't look fancy like the kind you get in the store. But this is one called a crane fly orchid. A lot of times, people tend to call it one of the Adam and Eve roots. It's also called putty root because the Rhizomes, in fact, you want to, Ed, you got your digger, if you want to dig, dig a piece, somebody. The, the, the little bulbs on it, when you crush them, are sticky, and you putty pottery together with it. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, it acts like putty, you know, like your putty, flat, broken pottery, like you drop the plate, you put it together. And that's last year's seed head flower stalk. Okay. They'll be white. You're getting to it. There it is. Okay. You can pass that around and look at it. And when you get through, if you if you crush it between your fingers, it'll get slightly tacky. But it's actually an orchid. No, it has little, little. It'll have that stem with little tiny seeds on it. Little blooms and little seeds. You actually have an orchid that people have in their yards a lot in, in summertime called ladies' tresses. You and it's an, it's an actual orchid, the too. And the blooms at the same time. 
with this stalk with blooms on it and all the leaves. Yeah, just like like a lot of the wild the onions, the like ramps and stuff. You know, the leaves die back before the blooms are on it, and vice versa. That's it. It's all into these woods this time of year. The Adam and Eve root, the true Adam and Eve root, looks the same, but it doesn't have purple underneath usually. Oh, okay. And leaves, yeah, they're all into here and right here, and, and it's pleated. The leaves are pleated, have little bumps in them. You'll notice it's um, not used a lot in in white herbal medicine. Among blacks, it was used as an aphrodisiac and for gambling. And if you look at the the if you dig a, a bunch of it up, oh. Oh, I wondered what he no, meant by gambling. No, it's to increase your luck. <laughs> oh. And oh. It's, it was an aphrodisiac, because if you look at it, you'll see a chain of those bulbs, and it's Adam going into Eve, Adam going into Eve. It's, it's a sexual connotation to it. And so it was used as an aphrodisiac. You'll still... See, Tommy, his main teacher was a, was a black midwife. So a lot of what he taught me actually came from a, a black folklore, not all of it, but a large percentage. So I'll get together some of these old black herb doctors that are still, a few of them still around, or talking to some of the ladies in the lunchroom at my school, and I know what they're talking about. Like I said, boarhog root, white people don't know about boarhog root normally. That's a black herb. And if somebody's asking me about it at school, and I said, yeah, watch this. And I said, old Miss Kurt, you know, about 80 years old. I said, Miss Kurt, you ever heard of boarhog root? <laughs> yeah, she's out. Yeah. Well, they knew it. They didn't have to explain it. No. Nope. Come on now. Sumac. sumac. Which sumac? Smooth. Smooth sumac. See? Nice and smooth. And sell the white on it. That wild yeast for making sourdough. Works just fine. You can always tell it by the nodes for next year's blooms. Or next year's flower stalks. Not flower stalks, leaves, branches. What part do you use? The whole plant. All of it. Okay. Mm. You. Tell me. What are you going to use it for? The berries. Mm -hmm. For diarrhea. Just you can. Tonic. Very strange. What else? The berries. Uh huh. Huh? Um, sore throat. Sore throat. Good source of vitamin C. Vitamin C, mouth ulcers, canker sores. The kidneys, one of my favorite kidney herbs. What else? We were talking about it earlier. On the road, before we dropped down the hill, dog fennel. Was, what does dog fennel do? It's an antiviral. This is one of the better antiviral herbs you can use. Then if you use the, the branches, they're antiviral as well, but even higher in tannins for anything you'd want to stop bleeding, internal bleeding, diarrhea, mouth ulcers, canker sores. You can chop that up and put it in the sap. Whatever you say. We, 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 put, it, we put it in the last mm -hmm. yeah, It'll be very good for that. Now, if I'd grabbed that and went ow, it would have been prickly ash. <laughs> there was. Another Eupatorium. This is the summer bone set, the other queen of the matter. It has a hole, remember, shotgun in it? Not bitter. So if I was wanting to use an antiviral that wasn't bitter, this would be one I'd use, use the roots. It's also good for another kidney herb and very good for uh, diabetes. A one-year-old root of this looks like a ginseng root. In fact, that looks like ginseng. Mm -hmm. And they'll get, they learn to not get taken by diggers. Poke root. But, nice size poke root. Yeah. We'll talk about that when we make the salve. 